Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this fall's Kurt Firmet's lecture, The Future of Money, How the Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance. Um, the, um, uh, the speaker tonight is Professor Eswar Prasad. Um, and uh, this, this distinguished visitorship, I should add, was established to honor the late Kurt Firmetz, who was a renowned banker, uh, as well as patron of the arts and a longtime member of our board of trustees at the American Academy. Kurt Firmetz was the vice chairman of JP Morgan and head of the supervisory board at the Hippo Real Estate. Um, the uh, visitorship was inaugurated in 2008 by a consortium of donors, and uh, it honors uh, Kurt Fiermetz's really remarkable career in international finance, as well as his dedication to the transatlantic relationship. The program brings outstanding individuals in the fields of uh, finance and economics from uh, the US to the American Academy. And uh, in the past, we've had the honor of welcoming uh, such uh, scholars and, and policymakers as David Lipton, uh, economist uh, Barry Eichengreen, I should say David Lipton of both the US Treasury and the IMF, and uh, former Secretary of the Treasure, Treasury, uh, Lawrence Summers. Tonight we have, as I said, the honor of welcoming Eswar Prasad, who is the Tolani Senior Professor of Trade Policy and of Economics uh, at uh, Cornell. Uh, unfortunately, we're still dealing with some of the disruptions due to COVID, so we're very sorry that Eswar couldn't join us in Berlin, um, but we've uh, let him know that uh, we're going to uh, get him here come hell or high water, and we're really eager to uh, welcome him uh, at the Academy on the Bonze. Eswar has just published uh, a book with the same title as today's lecture. I want to congratulate him on that. If you haven't seen the reviews, they've been glowing and enviable. Uh, in this talk, he will discuss the transformation from cash to digital currencies and how this is going to affect our lives, our businesses, uh, banking and government. And uh, he'll also discuss the trade-offs that we may see between flexibility and market access on the one hand and privacy, accountability and stability on the other. Uh, along with teaching at Cornell, as far as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the New Century Chair in International Economics. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His work focuses mainly on the macroeconomics of financial globalization and on monetary and exchange rate policies uh, in emerging markets in South Asia, in India, and in China. Uh, formerly, Eswar was the chief of the Financial Studies Division at the International Monetary Funds Research Department, and he was also head of the IMF's China Division. He has testified before various committees in the US Congress, along with uh, The Future of Money, which is being published by Harvard University Press. Eswar has written Gaining Currency, The Rise of the RMB, and The Dollar, Trip, to dollar Trap, sorry, How the US Dollar Tightened Its Grip on Global Finance. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Financial Times, Foreign Policy, the Harvard Business Review, and, and many other places. He is a frequent commentator on radio and television, uh, on, for example, the BBC, on Bloomberg, CNBC, and CNN. He is cited regularly and extensively in The Economist, the Financial Times, the New York Times, and many other publications. Let me just say a quick word about um, the structure of this uh, presentation. Uh, Eswar will speak for 35 to 40 minutes. After that, I'll have a question or two for him. And uh, I encourage you to start sending in your questions uh, as soon as the spirit moves you. Uh, please do this through the Q&A function uh, on the Zoom screen. Uh, do not raise your hand um, because uh, you will be raising your hand uh, in, in, um, in the forest, as it were, and uh, we will not be able to call on you. So uh, please do send in those questions and um, Eswar will uh, uh, take the questions uh, after, uh, after he and I speak and um, he, I'm sure he'll do his best to get to as many as he can. I'm sorry if, we're not, if we don't have time to get to everything. So with that, it's a great pleasure uh, to turn the screen over to you, Eswar. 
Thank you, Daniel, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's really a privilege to give this um, lecture, which, as you noted, has been delivered by many illustrious persons uh, um, in the past. And um, I'm very grateful to you and your colleagues in the Academy for arranging this. And truly, uh, it is a matter of deep personal regret that I cannot be with uh, all of you in person um, in Berlin. It's one of my um, favorite cities in Europe. Every time I visit there, I come away with a warm um, feeling and I do hope to be able to visit uh, there at some point. So today I'm going to talk about uh, um, the future of money and I'm going to draw largely on um, the book I have just uh, um, written, which um, uh, Daniel alluded to. Um, now, when I started working on this book about um, three or four years ago, I was going to look at central bank digital currencies and what digital currencies more broadly might mean for monetary policy, because I hang out with central bankers a lot. And at the time, I was getting questions about what the digital transformation might mean for finance, for central banking. And I decided to go out and read what was out there. And it turned out there wasn't very much out there. Um, so I started doing some research on my own. And as I started thinking about digital currencies, I realized I needed to think about the broader transformations taking place in the world of finance, which come under the rubric of fintech, which is just a term for financial technologies more broadly. And then to think about what cryptocurrencies might mean. And that led me through uh, an exciting intellectual journey, trying to understand exactly how cryptocurrencies work, what their implications might be. And then, um, of course, as I started working on the book over the last couple of years, it's become clear that central bank digital currencies are really the wave of the future. Um, so after talking about that in the book, I then um, spent some time, um, the last three chapters of the book, thinking about the implications for uh, monetary policy, for financial markets and for financial stability, and indeed more broadly for the uh, international monetary system. Uh, but as you will see, there are implications that we will need to deal with, not just in terms of the economic fallout, but also um, the societal fallout that might be implied by the change to uh, digital currencies. So we'll talk through cryptocurrencies to begin with, and I want to give you a sense of how marvelous the technology is, even if there are some legitimate concerns about cryptocurrencies themselves. We'll then talk about central bank digital currencies and what all of these might imply in the different dimensions that I alluded to. Now, in finances and everything else, timing is everything. Um, and as we know, in mid-September of 2008, um, things started coming apart in the US financial system. September 15, 2008 is the so-called Lehman moment uh, when the financial giant Lehman Brothers um, went under and it threatened to take the US financial system and perhaps even the entire global financial system down with it. Um, it was in late October, about six weeks later, that this very interesting blog post appeared um, on a particular um, uh, uh, website. Um, and you will notice that it um, appeared on uh, Friday, October 31st. It was um, written by uh, a person called um, Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know to this day who exactly that person is, or even if it is a group of persons. And it starts with a very modest notion. It says, I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. It turns out this very modest sounding blog post was a signpost indeed for the beginnings of a very important revolution. It was a few weeks later in early January that the first version of Bitcoin was released. Um, the white paper came out just six weeks before and the timing is really important in terms of understanding why Bitcoin got such traction relatively quickly. It's because at the time, trust in governments and central banks, and indeed in traditional financial institutions such as commercial banks was really at a great low. So the notion that Bitcoin might provide a way to undertake transactions where you could do these transactions just using your digital identities rather than your um, actual identities. And to be able to conduct these transactions without having to rely on central bank money or an intermediary such as a commercial bank. That was a very attractive um, proposition. 
So it was a remarkable promise um, how one could do this, because if you think about um, uh, what Bitcoin was trying to accomplish, it's really quite remarkable. Now, trust is the underpinning for any financial system. And we think about using um, the uh, euro notes in our bank fold, um, in our bill fold, <laughs> or perhaps US dollar notes. These are all relying on trust that we have in our central banks. When we think about the money that sits in our commercial bank accounts, we trust that those institutions will guard our money, or at least that there is a government overseeing those institutions. So how can one conduct these transactions without um, an intermediary being present? There are certain interesting building blocks, and I want to guide you through a little bit of the blockchain technology, because I think um, it is not only a marvel in itself, but as we will see later in the lecture, these are going to have a transformative effect on finance. So no matter what happens with Bitcoin, I think the real legacy of Bitcoin is going to be the technology it has um, bequeathed to us. So what are the building blocks? Now, when you hear about cryptocurrencies, you might think um, that everything is hidden and secret and that's how this works. That's not quite the case. It turns out that Bitcoin is in fact remarkably transparent as we will see. But there are some cryptographic elements that come into play. So cryptographic systems are capable of generating pairs of keys uh, that can be used to manage digital wallets. These are wallets that exist only uh, in the digital space. So you can think about this combination of public and private keys as the analog, for instance, to the user ID to your bank account, and then the password. You need both of these in order to access that um, uh, bank account or wallet and to be able to use the money in it. Now, even if people were to find out about your user ID or account number, it wouldn't help them very much because they wouldn't be able, uh, nobody would be able to um, access your balances using just that. So you need what is called the private key or in effect your password as well. But it turns out there is one other element of cryptography that is important as well. And this is called a hash function. Now a hash function is essentially um, a cryptographic tool that takes an input of any size and creates an output that is in a standardized format. Why is this valuable? This is valuable because it means that you can take the information from any transaction, run it through a hash function, and it creates a unique digital fingerprint of every transaction. This is an example of a very simple cryptographic hash function, and it's just a stylized example. But as you can see, what is important, if you change even one minor element of the input that goes into this cryptographic hash function, it's going to completely change the output. And this property is very important in terms of ensuring the uniqueness of these digital fingerprints, but also it means that you cannot work backwards from the output to the input. Um, because there is a, a, a one-way aspect to this. Um, anytime you use the same hash function and give the same input, it's always going to provide the same output, but using the output, and even if you had the access to that hash function, you could not go back to the uh, input. And these hash functions, in addition to generating these uh, um, pairs of uh, digital keys, also turn out to have very important um, implications in terms of being able to verify transactions, because again, each of them is going to have a unique digital signature. There is one more element that is important here, and this is where the transparency comes in, the notion of distributed ledger technology. Now, DLT, as it's um, uh, referred to, predated Bitcoin, but Bitcoin turns out to use it in a very effective way. So what is DLT? If you think about the ledgers that are maintained by commercial banks, those are all electronic ledgers. So the fact that you have digital ledgers are nothing new. You have um, a bank maintaining the ledger so that when you want to use um, your account for any payment, for instance, um, somebody can query your bank to see whether in fact you have those balances in your account and then the payment can be made. So the ledger is maintained by an institution. What is interesting about a distributed ledger is that it is maintained on multiple computers. And in fact, distributed ledgers can in fact be completely open. So you can have distributed ledgers that are maintained by multiple banks, um, but that are not visible to anybody else. 
but you can also have open uh, digital ledgers where basically all the transactions that are uh, conducted using say Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency or any financial transactions for that matter can be maintained on these open public ledgers. Now, this is a remarkable amount of transparency and this is what Bitcoin gives you. It turns out that if you conduct transactions using Bitcoin, all those transactions, um, the digital identity of the person who's paying, the recipient of that money, and the amount of that money are all available for the world to see. Um, all the existing transactions using Bitcoin are available if you know exactly where to look. And all you really need is a computer connection and the knowledge of where to look. Now, why does this help? It turns out that this is actually a very important feature of Bitcoin because these digital ledgers are completely transparent and because they are maintained on multiple computers and synchronized in real time, the system becomes very secure because now being able to hack into one computer or a couple of computers is not going to compromise the entire system. If one computer node fails, it doesn't matter for the integrity of the system. And more importantly, if any malevolent actor tries to tamper with one or two transactions, that will be very quickly detected by the network and those transactions will be discarded as illegitimate transactions. So if you think about the technical challenges that Bitcoin had to meet, you need to think about how to validate transactions without a trusted intermediary being involved. And this involves a process called attaining consensus by which all the computers in the network, all the members of the community, so to speak, have to agree that it is a valid transaction. You also need to verify those transactions if there is any question about any of them. And for a digital currency, because it's purely digital, you want to make sure that there is no way to double spend a unit of currency. If you think about taking a Euro note to um, a coffee shop, once you um, pay, um, the coffee shop owner with um, that uh, euro note. It's gone and that settlement is immediately uh, finalized and the settlement, which means the updating of accounting balances takes place immediately. But since this is just digital, what prevents people from using the same unit of money multiple times? It turns out that Bitcoin has a particular way of achieving this public consensus. And it is a very interesting um, uh, process. You may have heard of this notion of Bitcoin mining. Um, so this is what Bitcoining mining is. The network, the Bitcoin network is run by an algorithm, which was designed by this Nakam uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that was, and it runs um, uh, autonomously. Nobody uh, can interfere with it and nobody um, decides um, how it is run. It runs automatically. So it generates um, a numerical problem and the particular feature of this numerical problem, which actually involves those hash functions that I mentioned, is that can only be solved by brute force computing power. So having smarter algorithms won't solve it. Now, once that problem is solved, what happens is that that solution is very um, quickly broadcast to the other nodes. And this is where the hash function becomes very important. Remember, I told you that if you have an input, you run it through a hash function, it gives you exactly the same um, output. So once you know the correct answer, you can run it through a hash function, make sure uh, that that input corresponds to the correct output that is required by the Bitcoin algorithm. So when this happens, a block of transactions um, that can now be uh, validated is added to the existing public ledger of transactions. And this is why the notion of blockchain comes in. That is, you take a block of transactions and when this uh, problem that is created by the algorithm is solved, whoever solves that problem gets to validate that set of transactions and then it is automatically through computer code linked up with all the pre-existing blocks. This is where the term blockchain comes from. Now, why would anybody bother to do this? Because after all, if you have to use computing resources, you need a computer, you need to devote uh, a computing time to that. Um, you need energy to run the computers. It turns out this is where Bitcoin really turns out to be uh, uh, remarkable in terms of providing the economic incentive. Because the person who gets to solve that problem first, 
who gets to um, uh, validate the transactions gets a reward in the form of Bitcoin. So this is the process by which you get an incentive for people to mine Bitcoin, validate the transactions and create new Bitcoin. So this is a stylized description of how it works. Um, so you want to have two people trying to conduct a transaction, they post their transactions to the uh, network. And then uh, in step three, some miner uh, using computing power solves the problem. Um, that block of transactions is now validated. It's chained to the previous transactions. All the computers on the network update their electronic ledgers, new Bitcoin are created and away we go. So this is remarkable. At one level, what Bitcoin has done is solve all of these problems about validation of transactions in a remarkable way. So it sounds great, but remember, the objective of Bitcoin was to facilitate transactions, that is to serve as a medium of exchange. Does Bitcoin work well? It turns out that for the purpose for which it was designed, it actually does not work very well. As you've no doubt seen and read, the price of Bitcoin is very volatile. Um, moreover, it turns out that the Bitcoin network, because of this validation process, uh, takes a lot of time to verify transactions. It cannot process too many transactions. It takes at least, uh, on average, 10 minutes to validate a transaction. So it's not really viable uh, for day-to-day -day transactions. Um, so it's turned out to be a not very good medium of exchange. Now, in the early days, Bitcoin, because of the um, ostensible anonymity provided, was used to fuel illicit commercial activities. It turns out that that is not the main attraction of Bitcoin anymore. It turns out that if you use Bitcoin for a lot of transactions or use Bitcoin to get actual goods and services, your digital identity can, with some effort, be connected to your real identity. You've heard about ransomware attacks where a payment is demanded in Bitcoin. That actually takes a fair degree of sophistication to hide your digital trails completely. So this is not the main attraction of Bitcoin anymore. There are other concerns. If you lose your um, private key, which is sort of like your password, it's gone. If you lose the password to your bank account, you can walk in uh, to the local branch of your bank or give them a call and they will check your identification and give you a new password. If you lose the key to your Bitcoin digital wallet, it's gone because there is nobody uh, that you can call. The other remarkable thing about Bitcoin is that while it has not worked well in its ostensible use as a medium of exchange, it's become a speculative asset. Now you might say if something is not functioning the way it was supposed to, why would it have any value? Bitcoin adherents seem to think that its scarcity is really an important driver of value. If you think about euros, they can be issued to whatever extent the European Central Bank wants. The Federal Reserve can print as many dollars as it wants. But Bitcoin's algorithm puts a hard cap of 21 million Bitcoins that can ever be created. About 18 and a half million Bitcoins have already been created. So there is the notion that scarcity gives Bitcoin value. But to me, as an economist, that's a dubious proposition. Just because something is scarce, um, given that it does not have intrinsic value, it's hard to imagine that it could maintain value. But certainly, like many other speculative assets, uh, it seems to have um, uh, caught the fascination of the investor community. But Bitcoin really has some other issues. Um, this consensus mechanism by which transactions are validated is terrible for the environment. Um, right now, Bitcoin miners use these um, specialized machines that are used just for Bitcoin mining. They're called ASICs or application specific integrated circuits that are set up specifically to mine a particular cryptocurrency. Um, and there are a vast number of cryptocurrencies out there. So it turns out that you have arrays of computers in the bottom part of this figure shows you a Bitcoin mine where a large number of these ASICs are linked together to increase the amount of computing power. Because remember, on the Bitcoin network, it's the first person who solves the problem uh, who, gets to, um, who gets the Bitcoin reward. So the amount of energy that is spent um, on running the computers, on cooling the computers, dealing with the computer detritus that is created because these machines are running full blast all the time. Uh, so they wear out very quickly. This is a really significant cost um, of Bitcoin. 
Now, there are other cryptocurrencies that are emerging that are trying to solve um, the problems created by Bitcoin and deal with many of its flaws. One of the problems with Bitcoin, it's very unstable value. So you now have stable coins and their value is stable because they are linked um, to fiat currencies. Um, and this is an interesting approach, although it is somewhat ironical because the whole point of Bitcoin was to get away from uh, government issued or central bank issued money and stable coins try to create more effective payment systems, uh, but they're backed up by, um, uh, by stores of fiat currencies. Um, there are alternative consensus protocols that are coming up um, that are not as environmentally destructive as proof of uh, work are much more efficient in terms of processing a large volume of transactions. And then you have new cryptocurrencies that are emerging, which certainly give uh, regulators and governments some cause for concern that have much better um, uh, protection mechanisms in terms of anonymity and the stronger anonymity uh, might allow them to be used um, for illicit activities once again, which is certainly a concern. Um, but there are other developments as well in the cryptocurrency world. Facebook, for instance, um, is um, proposing to issue its own stable coins. Why is Facebook doing this? Um, Facebook claims that it is out of the goodness of its heart. Uh, Facebook points out correctly enough that there is a real need for low cost digital payments that everybody has easy access to. Um, international payments are even more difficult and there is a need for better international payments that are quicker, less expensive. And Facebook says that its stable coin will serve these functions. Now, do we really trust Facebook um, to not start developing its own currency if this were to gain traction? Uh, I think this is a real fear. And of course, um, there are questions about whether a Facebook stable coin might end up again becoming a conduit for illicit uh, um, financing um, of activities such as drug trafficking, terrorism financing, money laundering, and so on. So these are real concerns, but of course the cryptocurrency world um, has caught fire and now there are what are called meme coins, which unlike Bitcoin, which at least had an ostensible function as a medium of exchange, don't even pretend to have a major function. You've probably heard about Dogecoin, um, which is just riffing off this meme uh, of a Shiba Inu, but it has a market capitalization last I looked uh, of a few billion dollars. So there is some degree of craziness uh, to this cryptocurrency world. But while crypto assets uh, are moving along, I think the blockchain technology is really going to be the legacy of uh, uh, Bitcoin, as I mentioned. So the blockchain technology in a decentralized form has a lot of applications. Um, this notion of decentralized finance or DeFi suggests that someday one might be able to conduct a broad range of financial transactions without having to use intermediaries such as um, say real estate um, attorneys or um, settlement agents who can allow you to buy a house, who can allow you to buy a car. Um, and in fact, there are these, um, uh, you know, space age sounding things like smart contracts, which allow transactions to be consummated on the blockchain without any trusted intermediaries being present. Again, this sounds very futurish, but the future is already here. This is a stylized representation of a simple smart contract. And in fact, there are smart contracts with far greater functionality than what I have depicted here. So this is a simple example where uh, you might have one person trying to uh, exchange a financial asset with another person or buy a financial asset, say a corporate bond or um, or a security um, of some sort from another person. It turns out that through computer code, you can set up a contract such that both parties deliver tokens which represent the money on the one hand and the financial asset on the other hand into this escrow, which is a smart contract itself. And once both of these um, elements have been deposited, then the smart contract automatically conducts the transfer between these two parties and they can then pull out their money in one case and the financial asset in another case. This sounds very bizarre, but actually there are many smart contracting functions that are already working and quite well. And here again, the transparency of the blockchain becomes very important because that 
generates a level of security and the ability to conduct transactions once you've agreed upon them in the form of contract code in a way that is really uh, tamper proof. Um, so decentralized systems have remarkable features. They are um, tolerant to faults because they have no single point of failure. It's not easy to attack them uh, technologically otherwise. And it's not possible for a few institutions or a few um, uh, malevolent actors to try to corrupt the entire system because again, everything is transparent. And there are many wonderful features of uh, decentralized finance. The fact that um, you don't need any permissions to use it um, and that it is completely um, open. Now, it turns out that you can take these individual decentralized finance products and actually use open source technology to connect these products together and build new, more sophisticated financial products. And again, this sounds very futurish, but the future is already here. Um, in the blue box, I've indicated an example of a savings contract that you can already access and that is already in operation. What it basically means that if you have some cryptocurrencies that are lying around in your um, uh, digital wallet, you can lend them to people who may want to use them for um, whatever purpose. And in return, you get an interest rate. But instead of each person getting that interest rate, you can sign up to a game where everybody who deposits those uh, cryptocurrencies um, into this lending account um, joins a lottery. And the winner of that lottery gets the interest payment of the entire group. So whoever the winner is gets his or her principal back plus the entire interest amount of the entire pool, while all the others get at least their principal back. This is a game, you might think, but in fact, these financial products already exist. Um, it turns out that compliance and regulatory tools can also be plugged into these Legos. But this is not to minimize the risks. These are new financial products, and as with any financial innovations, there are always concerns that you could have technological problems, you could have unsophisticated users uh, who get taken in by the technology and don't understand the risks. So there are many risks out there, but I think this uh, really has a lot of potential. So what are central banks, which are the traditional purveyors of money doing about all of this? Um, this is a picture of the key central banks in the world, and they have also had a fire lit under them by the cryptocurrency revolution. They are thinking of issuing digital versions of their own fiat currencies. Now, why are central banks thinking about um, uh, you know, creating this complement to cash? And I should point out that every central bank that is considering this thinks about the digital version of its currency as the equivalent of cash, except in digital form, and coexisting with cash. So why are they doing this? In some countries, there is a notion of broadening financial inclusion. In many developing countries, there isn't easy access to a low-cost digital payment system. Many people don't have access to banking services. So if each of us could have an account with the central bank, we could use that to make payments. And because it's a government-managed account um, or a central bank-managed account, presumably it would be very low cost, but it could also act as a portal for basic banking services such as credit, savings products, and so on. So in many developing countries, this is an important priority. And even in the US, about 5% of the adult population still remains unbanked or underbanked. So for instance, I could use Apple Pay on my phone and pay for most transactions with a swipe of a phone, but that Apple Pay account needs to be connected back to a credit card account or a bank account. So if you don't have one of those, you can't use this digital payment. Um, the Bahamas has already rolled out the first um, uh, nationwide central bank digital currency or CBDC in the world. And for them, financial inclusion is a very important priority. You could also think about this catalyzing innovation by the private sector to create better payment systems. Sweden is moving forward with experimenting with the CBDC. Why does Sweden need a CBDC? Um, bank accounts are easily accessible. Um, the use of cash is very fast disappearing in Sweden. Um, and digital payments provided by pi private payment providers are working very well. So why should the uh, government bother? The Riksbank, the Swedish central bank, is very concerned that if the entire payments infrastructure were to be in the hands of the private sector, that could become subject to technological vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities of confidence in the case of financial troubles and so on. So having a CBDC, the e-kroner, would essentially be a backstop to a private payment infrastructure. 
there are other motivations at play. For instance, um, the notion of maintaining monetary sovereignty, um, because um, uh, some central banks may not want their currency to have no use at all at the retail level. Um, and there might be the notion of continuing to maintain um, central bank money at the retail level. So there are many benefits to be had from a CBDC. I've spoken about the first couple of these already, but as you switch away from cash, you have other advantages as well. You could have um, a central bank digital currency because of its digital form, making it much harder to use central bank money um, for illicit commerce or for corruption. Certainly illicit commercial activities, corruption is not going to disappear, even if we were to get rid of cash and have all money be digital. But certainly having anything leave a digital trace will make uh, criminals, corrupt officials, think a little bit harder before they use um, uh, a central bank provided instrument to fuel um, those activities. Also, you will have economic activity coming out of the shadows and you can easily broaden tax revenues without changing tax rates. This is good for a government. Some people may not consider this a great uh, virtue of a CBDC, but certainly you would have much less shadow activity. There are other attractions to a central bank digital currency, especially if it is in the form of all of us having accounts with our respective national banks. If you think about giving money to the population, this happened, for instance, in the US when the coronavirus pandemic hit, stimulus payments were sent out to households um, below a certain income uh, threshold. Many of these households got direct bank deposits because they had direct bank deposit information with the Internal Revenue Service, but many others did not have that information, so they got prepaid debit cards, checks, which got misappropriated, which in some cases got lost, torn, mangled. This is a very inefficient way to undertake public transfers. In India, many subsidies are given to households, but now those subsidies have all been changed into direct cash transfers. So if everybody had a central bank digital currency account, you could do those cash transfers much more easily. There is also the possibility of negative interest rates. Now, negative interest rates are not a good thing in normal times. Even in desperate times, they are not a tool that a central bank would use lightly. But think about the difficulties uh, many of our economies have encountered in the last um, uh, 14, 15 years. There was the global financial crisis, the uh, Eurozone debt crisis, um, the coronavirus pandemic and the very deep recession that it created. In those desperate economic circumstances, you might want to have the ability to create negative nominal interest rates. Now, when you have cash, which is a zero nominal interest rate instrument, that becomes a little harder. Still, many um, uh, governments, including in Europe uh, and Japan and so on, have had negative interest rates. But having CBDC accounts, where you could basically shrink the balances over time, would make negative interest rates more feasible. Of course, this is a desperate economic measure for desperate times. And I don't think any central bank uh, would want to use this lightly, but certainly what we've seen over the last 15 years is that it's good to have additional instruments in the monetary policy toolkit precisely for those times. But as with any innovation, CBDCs come with risks. One of the principal risks is that if we had um, central bank digital currency accounts, in difficult times, we might choose to take our bank deposits and move them to these accounts. Why would you do that when your bank accounts are protected by deposit insurance? It might just be an additional measure of safety. After all, the government is always more uh, safe than depositing in um, a commercial bank, which is still subject to some degree of frailty. Even in normal times in a low interest rate environment, even though the CBDC account does not pay a positive interest rate, you might still view that as a better place to put money. So disintermediation of the banking system is a real problem. And you know, in modern economies, we think about central banks creating money, but commercial banks are really the most important creators of money that is credit that fuels economic activities. Besides, if the government provided a low cost um, uh, payment system, it might be very difficult for the private sector to compete with that. After all, who can compete with the government? There are also concerns of hacks of central bank digital currency accounts. And most importantly, concerns about the loss of privacy. Right now, you use a euro note, a dollar note. Um, uh, nobody knows uh, what sort of purchases you've made other than the person that you transact with. But certainly in a world where every payment is digital, 
either through a private payment provider or a central bank digital currency account, your payments might be visible. So there are many risks out there, but it turns out that technology and design choices can reduce, although not completely eliminate some of these risks. For instance, the very first risk about disintermediation of the banking system, the Bahamas, which as I mentioned, has rolled out the world's first CBDC, has solved this problem in a very simple way by putting a limit on the amount of money that can be maintained in a CBDC accounts. So you cannot have a massive amount of deposit flight from commercial banks into the CBDC accounts. Where do we stand with CBDC projects? It's coming. Um, this is one thing I can tell you, and one thing I quickly realized in the process of writing this book, the era of cash is not going to last much longer. CBDCs are coming around the world. Um, in addition to the Bahamas, which already land, launched the sand dollar, China, Sweden, and Japan have already uh, started trials of their central bank digital currencies for very different reasons. Um, Many other countries are already planning uh, trials, including the ECB. And any day now, the US Federal Reserve is set to unveil um, its own research on uh, um, uh, a possible digital dollar. Again, the motivations are quite different. In China's case, there are two payment providers, Alipay and WeChat Pay, that have done very well at providing efficient, low-cost digital payments to a large fraction of the Chinese uh, population, um, even the poor, the unbanked, those in rural areas. But in China, there is an interesting additional element, which is that the government is concerned that those two payment providers now dominate the payment system and are not allowing for easy entry by other payment providers. More importantly, they're gathering up a huge amount of data um, and not sharing it with the government. So this is a fairly serious concern um, that uh, is leading to many countries uh, undertaking these um, uh, CBDC projects. So in the last few minutes of my talk, let me um, discuss the implications for financial markets and for the international monetary system. One thing that is clear, like I said, is that physical cash is on its way out. Even if central banks continue to provide cash, I think the fact that we have easier access to low cost digital payments, which are much more convenient for consumers and even for businesses, which don't have to deal with cash and the possibility of loss, theft and other problems associated with cash, is going to organically lead to cash essentially disappearing. We're going to have channels for more people to participate in the financial system, including through more direct channels that connect savers and borrowers, that connect people on different sides of a financial transaction. And this is going to mean a fairly challenging environment for existing financial institutions, including um, commercial banks. Um, so I think we are at the threshold of some fairly significant changes um, that are looming in terms of financial markets. What about the international monetary system? Um, this is a picture of the four uh, biggest currencies and my two previous books were about the two currencies on the left and right end of the spectrum, the dollar and the renminbi. And of course the euro, the yen and the pound sterling uh, are very important currencies in the international sphere as well. On international finance also changes are coming. Some of the new technologies um, related to blockchain and other cryptocurrencies, I think are going to make international payments a lot um, easier. Um, it's going to be much easier for economic migrants sending remittances back to their countries. It's going to be easier for importers and exporters. Um, and how is it going to become easier? I think costs are going to fall because of competition. We are finding ways already for these transactions to be completed more quickly and for them to be tracked in real time. So this is going to create a lot of benefits, but will also make it much more challenging to control capital flows, either for legitimate or illegitimate purposes. Especially for smaller countries and emerging markets, this is going to be a big challenge. But as I look around the global landscape, is the introduction of the digital yuan, for instance, going to fundamentally change its role in international finance? At the margin, it could help. At the margin, maybe a digital yuan, if it was available outside China, could make it easier to conduct payment transactions in yuan. Um, so as a payment currency, it is plausible that we might have the yuan play a somewhat bigger role uh, in international payments, I don't, although I don't think it's going to rival the dollar in any way. But as you think about the reserve currency status of the euro, the dollar, and so on, that is underpinned by a number of elements. It's not just 
economic size of the country or economic region. It's not just depth of financial markets, but also the institutional framework, which includes the rule of law. It includes an independent central bank and an institutionalized system of checks and balances among different arms of the government. All of the current reserve currency economies uh, or uh, safe asset economies, including the US, the Eurozone, Japan, the UK, all have this even though these institutions certainly have been tested very sorely in the last few years in all of our countries. Uh, but I think China has not shown any willingness to undertake these types of institutional reforms. So I think it's unlikely that international investors will trust China um, given its present institutional framework. So I think that the dollar will remain the dominant reserve currency, although certainly the renminbi's importance as a reserve currency could increase a little bit over time. There are finally some big picture issues that all of this brings up. Um, one of these is what role really the government should play. At one level, you want the government playing a constructive role in making sure that you don't have um, certain payment providers becoming dominant. You want the government to provide regulatory and financial stability, and perhaps the payment infrastructure, which is the form of CBDC could take, that allows private payment providers to continue innovating on them. But if the government gets too concerned about financial stability and blocks private sector innovation, that's not so good. So for regulators in particular, finding a balance between facilitating innovation, but at the same time, identifying in advance um, institution specific and systemic risks and controlling them is going to be important. Will digitalization and the new technologies solve many of our deep-seated economic problems like um, inequality, there is a prospect they might by democratizing finance and increasing financial inclusion, but there is equally the risk that because we have very uneven amounts of uh, digital access and unequal financial literacy, the existing problems could in fact be exacerbated by the new technologies. And finally, we're all going to have to consider this as a societal level, not just as an economic or technocratic level about what all these changes are going to mean for the nature of our society, um, about whether um, central bank digital currencies, for instance, might lead to governments playing even more inclusive roles in our economies, in our financial markets, and in our society. So I think we are poised at the edge of a very exciting new financial uh, future but certainly there are some very scary prospects as well as we consider all that lies ahead of us. Thank you. Eswar, thank you for a dazzling presentation. My head is spinning. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm quite um, fearful that my uh, initial questions um, will um, uh, cause head slapping uh, among the rest of the uh, uh, viewers that, uh, because they seem so obviously answered. But let me ask you a few questions. So um, I'm, I'm guessing that almost everyone who is watching this uh, it went through the searing experience of the global financial crisis. And an important reason for the global financial crisis, as we all know, was uh, the employment of highly complex financial products uh, that no one had really fully thought through or that were sufficiently understood or sufficiently regulated. In um, the field that I know best, international relations, uh, I think there's, particularly after the last 20 or so years, a healthy respect uh, for unintended consequences. Uh, do people really believe that they can think through the, this kind of systemic change without creating um, just uh, you know, extraordinary vulnerabilities that um, we would all um, cringe at? So that's a profound question. And um, I'm sorry to hear that my lecture left your head spinning. I was hoping it would lead to a moment of uh, clarity that brings it all uh, into sharp focus. Um, but we did cover um, a lot of ground, certainly, Daniel. Um, I know a lot more than I did, OK? <laughs> my head's still spinning. <laughs> uh, you'll have to read the book for true clarity. Um, 
That's a profound question, Daniel, and I don't think we have a good answer to that. Um, the history of financial innovations uh, teaches us that um, uh, believing that either um, financial engineering or uh, technology will solve um, problems related to financial stability, I think, has proven um, wrong, spectacularly wrong indeed in multiple uh, cases. In the lead up to the global financial crisis, there was the idea that new instruments might allow us to spread risk um, more evenly and in a way that you did not have um, the sort of uh, creation of risk through new products. But in fact, we found that interconnected institutions were where risks were being pooled. Uh, the same thing uh, holds true right now um, in different dimensions. If you think about um, cryptocurrencies, um, right now, the market capitalization of all um, cryptocurrencies put together is approaching two and a half trillion dollars. You know, a lot of this is notional money out there, but um, a lot of investors do have money um, locked up in these cryptocurrencies. So if that market uh, were to fail because of a uh, failure of investor faith, um, you could have significant ripple effects on the rest of the financial system. And then if you think about stable coins, which are supposed to provide um, easy uh, access to payment systems, and there is a genuine need for better payment systems at the domestic and international levels, those stable coins themselves could become sources of financial instability. In the lead up to the global financial crisis, what was seen as a very safe instrument in the US was the money market mutual fund, because any dollar collected by money market mutual fund was supposed to be backed up by holdings of liquid securities, which could very easily be sold if there was a demand for redemption um, of those mutual funds. In the global financial crisis, those securities turned out not to be liquid, and the money market mutual funds themselves became a source of financial stability, um, instability. That might be the case for stable coins as well. Um, and there are already concerns about whether an existing stable coin tether um, uh, does have the amount of backing that it claims it does. And then if you think about this um, uh, decentralized finance that I mentioned, um, it opens up enormous possibilities, but um, you know things as simple as software bugs um, or broader technological vulnerabilities um, that can be exploited, especially by sophisticated hackers, uh, create all sorts of new risks. I think from a regulatory point of view, the critical question is whether um, you can prevent these risks, even if they do emanate, from spilling over into the broader financial system. And as the crypto financial ecosystem becomes larger, I think that risk becomes a, a more important one. There are concerns about use of cryptocurrencies for um, illicit activities, especially for cross-border financing of such activities. That is something that governments have to get um, uh, involved in. Um, so the amount of risks that are created can be thought of in terms of financial stability, investor protection, monetary stability, and a lot more. Um, so this is going to be a very challenging environment. And in the best of circumstances, let us say that we have decentralized finance working well, these um, other um, uh, financial intermediaries doing very good work at financial intermediation, but displacing the banks. Then how is monetary policy going to work in that setup? Because right now, monetary policy works essentially by affecting the cost of funds, uh, and through the banking channel, if banks stop becoming uh, uh, are not as important as they are anymore, who exactly is going to create credit in these economies? Um, how will interest rate transmission work to the real economy? These are very um, deep questions that monetary policymakers are going to have to grapple with. So it's a very uncertain um, and potentially risky world out there. Well, okay, um, maybe a less. Um profound question. Um, why wouldn't um, banks uh, strangle this in the cradle, um, since it seems to profoundly threaten their livelihoods? So banks are taking two approaches. Number one is um, sometimes they're joining the game. Um, so there are many banks in the US that have started setting up um, lower cost uh, uh, online only operations. Um, that uh, at least keep them in the game without um, cutting themselves out altogether. They are 
I'm certain, um, uh, prodding um, regulators into taking a more serious look at cryptocurrencies. Um, and there are regulatory actions coming um, in the US. Um, there is regulation of stable coins that has been proposed and about the cryptocurrency world more broadly. China has completely cracked down on cryptocurrencies. Now, it's a little difficult to manage this regulation because it is not conducted by any specific institutions. A lot of it is decentralized and can be conducted on these decentralized blockchains. So there is no border uh, to Bitcoin, for instance. But China has basically prohibited any of its citizens or financial institutions from undertaking any cryptocurrency related trades or other transactions. And when the Chinese government um, uh, has that sort of edict, uh, people in China do tend to take it fairly um, um, seriously. Uh, but there is, I think, a concern for banks, um, for uh, banks, a traditional uh, function of intermediating between savers and borrowers can be done by technology platforms right now, which have proven very effective at um, assessing credit risks and various other types of risks and certain uh, profitable operations such as international money transfers can soon uh, be undertaken by alternative platforms which will substantially reduce the margins of commercial banks so this is going to be a very challenging time for commercial banks in the few years ahead um the um i think you make a case um uh, that's very strong for uh, central bank backed uh, digital currencies and i can see how that could have all kinds of uh, benefits. I have to say I'm intuitively um, sympathetic to the Chinese approach to uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and I'm wondering why there hasn't been more blowback as it were um, in the US and elsewhere when you, I mean, you make a strong case about transparency and yet it still seems as though a cryptocurrency is designed to evade uh, regulation, taxation, to allow for illicit activities. Um, you know, I, if, if you have the decentralization that you're speaking of, how will you have, uh, you know, the sort of verification of who the parties are? Um, it's, to my mind, it, it's, I don't understand what uh, the regulator's argument for allowing this to persist will be. Yeah, who um, should be regulated is a question that regulators are grappling with because given that Bitcoin um, can be transacted um, uh, on these um, uh, decentralized blockchains, uh, it's not obvious that there is a specific institution um, that can be brought under the purview of regulators, but the regulators in the US, for instance, are trying to um, go after the centralized exchanges where a lot of the trading activity has now um, moved to. Um, but that's going to still leave a lot of uh, holes out there. Uh, but one question that the government needs to ask again is what role it's, it's um, uh, what role should it play in the financial system? If people want to go out and speculate on, um, on an asset, um, even gold, you might argue, is a relatively speculative asset because its value is far out of line with its um, intrinsic value. Um, so should the government say that this is a speculative asset and it should not be uh, traded? Certainly Bitcoin allows um, uh, certain more nefarious activities unlike gold. So maybe there is a, strongest case, a stronger case for clamping down on it. But if people want to invest in it so long as there are no uh, financial stability risks and so long as you have um, investor protection to the sense that uh, um, you know um, uh, malevolent exchanges and so on cannot make away with people's money. And so long as there is financial literacy so that people understand what risk they're getting into. It's not obvious what more the government can do, but each of these pillars is currently lacking right now. The amount of investor protection, financial literacy, um, the ability to protect the system from uh, malevolent hackers, none of those um, uh, is in place um, right now. And there is also an irony here, Daniel, which is that um, while the cryptocurrency industry certainly was intended, at least at first blush, to get away from the control by the government, anytime the government steps in, it actually provides some degree of legitimacy to the industry. So for instance, the Internal Revenue Service, as I um, uh, briefly alluded to earlier, um, uh, connotes Bitcoin as a financial asset. So in principle, 
holders of Bitcoin are supposed to report uh, their holdings and their capital gains on those holdings to the IRS and get taxed on it. And I've heard from a number of people um, who've invested in Bitcoin that if the government is after all collecting uh, taxes on Bitcoin, it must be okay. Um, so maybe it's all right if I invest in it. So um, I think there is a real risk here that the government um, uh, intruding on this industry to a limited extent might have a counterproductive effect of legitimizing the industry. And the industry in fact has been calling for some degree of regulation precisely for that reason. But there is a real risk here of regulatory gaps because we don't know how exactly to regulate some of these. We don't know what institutions to go after. Um, so I think there are serious concerns that are emerging. And the other complications that you cannot just regulate at the national level, ultimately, we're going to have uh, co cooperation across countries necessary uh, to bring these cryptocurrencies and the entire crypto ecosystem um, under reign. A completely fascinating set of problems. So I see that the questions are coming in. I'll, I'm going to just pose one more, and then I'll leave you to uh, answer the uh, the questions from um, from the viewers. And this this may be the most easily dispatched. But uh, in 2003, um, to oversimplify things, a, little, a tree fell in Ohio, and uh, the whole East Coast lost power. And the nice thing about cash. Uh, at least for the, um, you know, the humble uh, individual consumer, uh, you know, living on Main Street in the U.S. I actually live on Main Street in the U.S. too. Um, you know, still has a, a wallet with some some dollars in it and can go buy milk at the uh, store. Um, is there an, a technological Achilles heel here? In I mean, we do even in this day and age still have big power outages from time to time. I think there are real um, technological vulnerabilities one should think about. Now, the distributed ledgers do have the advantage that they are maintained on multiple computers um, in different um, locations. So um, the prospect of the entire network failing is uh, um, quite limited, although people in specific locations could lose access to that network. And you're right that in a pinch, uh, in the case of natural disasters or uh, the sort of apocalyptic scenarios that many um, uh, people in the US and elsewhere in the survivalist communities think about. Having cash would certainly be useful. Uh, but you know, even here, there are technological solutions that are arising for all but the bleakest of apocalypse scenarios. Um, so for instance, it turns out that certain types of um, uh, digital wallets can be stored in your mobile phones and you can conduct transactions using near field communication, NFC, even if two phones in an area don't have access um, to a wireless or mobile network. Now, eventually those uh, phones do have to connect back to a network so that the account balances can be updated. But at least in the short run, uh, for a brief period, if um, you and I, Daniel, were to be in a place in a forest um, in a remote part of Germany without uh, a network access, I don't know if there are any parts of Germany that don't have access, but if there was such a part, you and I could exchange money. And then we would go back into our um, areas with networks and our uh, digital wallet balances would be um, uh, updated. Likewise, if you think about the privacy issue, there too, a technological solution is um, emerging. So I mentioned the case of China issuing, uh, experimenting with the digital yuan. So they're coming with different grades of digital wallets. So the lowest grade digital wallet um, can have only a small um, account balance, can be used only for small transactions, say buying a few dumplings on the street or some uh, fruit from a vendor. And there you have a greater degree of anonymity. But as the value of the transactions you want to conduct uh, increases, you need more sophisticated digital wallets where you have to meet, know your customer and other regulatory requirements so that the bona fides of the transacting parties can be verified. So technology is actually giving us a way to deal with some of these vulnerabilities, but ultimately the concern about a crippling hack of the entire system, um, which again is something we've experienced uh, in the past or uh, a massive power outage, could certainly affect the ability to use one of these digital forms of payment. So, um, uh, you know, I uh, have to admit this that I wrote a book about the future of money, but I still 
tip my Uber drivers in cash because the thing, the tactile element of cash and the personal connection it creates cannot really be matched, you know, when you just swipe a, a phone over a, um, a card reader. Um, so I think that cash will uh, still last, but the reality again is that once we all get used to the convenience of digital payments and the pandemic certainly accelerated this process, it's going to be hard to see cash remaining viable too much longer. Right, and I'm sure there was a time, and I've seen you write about this when no one could imagine paper money either. So, um, you know, we do make these big transitions. With that, why don't I turn it over to you and you can um, uh, deal with the questions that have come in. Okay, so one question about how um, with digitalization, the worth of money will still be ensured. Um, that's uh, a fundamental question about what, um, where the value of money comes from. Um, if you think about fiat currencies issued by central banks, um, why do they have um, uh, value at all? At one level, one can argue that central bank money is backed up by the taxing power of the government. If the government declares the currency to be legal tender, it can require that the taxes that it levies be paid only with that currency. So basically the taxing power of the government stands behind fiat currency. But having said that, um, in the last few years, we've seen um, governments, especially in the advanced economies, run massive uh, budget deficits, accumulating huge amounts of public debt. Uh, the balance sheets of the major central banks, including the ECB and the Fed, have increased enormously. Essentially, they've been printing money. Um, but people still seem to view um, central bank money as having value and likely to remain a store of value. Um, with cryptocurrencies, I think there is a real question about whether the value will remain, especially as a medium of exchange. And one of the things we are likely to see in the coming years um, in terms of the nature of money, I think, is a bifurcation of the roles of money. Right now, you can think about the money in your wallet or there is in digital form um, on your debit card connected to your bank account. It's essentially providing a medium of exchange as well as a store of value. But one can well see something like a stable coin that is backed up by fiat currencies serving as a medium of exchange for both domestic and cross-border transactions, but not really as a store of value because its value is ultimately coming from its backing from fiat currencies. Um, so I think we might see these functions of money being separated um, in a very interesting way in the years come. And this is going to lead to more competition across currencies as well. What Ecuador has done might be interesting um, uh, as a specific example uh, to bring up in the context of this question. Ecuador recently declared um, Bitcoin to be a legal tender. Um, that is to say, anybody can use um, Bitcoin to settle debts in um, Ecuador and perhaps even use it for transactions. I argue that Bitcoin is not a great medium of exchange. So what is Ecuador trying to do? Ecuador has had a failing government and uh, a non-credible central bank for a long time. So a few years ago, they stopped creating their, uh, producing their own currency because uh, they basically threw up their hands and everybody in the economy was using dollars. So the current Ecuadorian government seems to be unhappy about what they view as dollar hegemony, although they brought it on themselves and perhaps wants to ride the Bitcoin wave. If Ecuador acquires a lot of Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin rises, maybe the government will have more money to spend. I don't think this experiment will uh, end up well. So ultimately, I think faith in the institution that issues either a central bank money, which is the central bank, of course, or whatever institution that issues it is going to be crucial. With Bitcoin, there is no institution, which is why I worry a little more about whether it is really going to hold its value in the long run. Um, another question is about whether um, CBDCs will um, be a gateway for people to get um, more into um, uh, DeFi, decentralized finance and cryptocurrency, or if it would be a way to combat uh, the growing interest in the crypto space. Um, my sense is that CBDCs will substantially undermine the use case for um, cryptocurrencies, including stable coins as mediums of exchange. Right now, the reality is that in many countries around the world, um, it's not easy to access um, digital payments. So um, uh, cryptocurrencies and stable coins in particular might serve that function. But if the central bank itself 
provides a digital version of its currency, and more importantly, if that currency is available to the masses and it is easy to use so that even um, illiterate people, people without much um, uh, digital literacy as well, uh, people in rural areas and so on can use it um, um, very easily, that is certainly going to increase the ability um, of a CBDC to displace um, cryptocurrencies and so on. Even if that were to happen, I think one needs to acknowledge that the revolution set off by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which I think has been a very important push for central banks to issue their digital currencies, is quite important in terms of uh, um, uh, what sort of changes that it has created in the um, financial system. Um, so I don't think CBDCs ultimately will uh, play this role. And this also brings up an interesting observation about two countries that I've briefly mentioned in the talk, China and India. China and India have, you know, middle, uh, China is an upper middle income country right now uh, with a per capita income of a little over $10,000. India is a lower middle income country. In both of these countries, the use of cash is plunging because the availability of low cost digital payments uh, in China's case, thanks to private payment providers. In India's case, thanks to private payment providers building on top of a government provided payments infrastructure is reducing the use of cash. Um, again, the COVID pandemic um, accelerated the shift, but it was happening already. So in fact, in these two countries, the user case for a CBDC is much less than in other countries. I think in the US, there is more of a user case than there might be um, in India and China. But even these two countries are moving forward. Why is that? In China's case, as I mentioned, it's because an ECNY can be seen as a payment infrastructure provided by the government that other payment providers, other than Alipay and WeChat Pay, can now enter and create innovations so that those two payment providers don't dominate the payment space anymore. In India's case, um, the, um, the government provided payment infrastructure is working quite well, uh, but I think it needs to be scaled up a lot more. And the CBDC might provide another avenue for scaling up these low cost digital payments. So um, I think the user case for CBDCs is there around the world. And even in a country like China and India where digital payments are easily available, I think if you think about it as a, um, a competition between CBDC and cash, there is a case to be made for CBDC to at least um, be provided in tandem with cash. Um, the next question is whether the uh, cryptocurrency would change the fundamentals of monetary policy established at uh, Bretton Woods um, as private pools could generate new currencies and therefore increase the overall availability of money. This is an intriguing question. And at one level, you know, in the long arc of history, um, this points to a very interesting development. Um, Daniel already alluded to this. Um, you know, the creation of money itself was a major financial innovation. And then the creation of paper currency um, in China in the seventh century was a major innovation. The next big step was in the 13th century when Kublai Khan issued the first unbacked paper currency. Um, so it was not backed up by commodities or precious metals. So it was a real innovation in its time. After that, government currencies and private currencies competed for a long time. Private currencies issued by commercial merchants, money lenders, and so on. And then the establishment of central banks around the world, which started with the Riksbank um, a couple of centuries ago, decisively shifted um, that competition in favor of um, um, governments or central banks. So now we are coming into a new era where there is a renewed competition between private currencies and central bank currencies. And as an economist, I think competition is a good thing. And already we are seeing innovations in the form of even central bank money, thanks to the uh, cryptocurrency um, revolution. But it's also worth keeping one more thing in mind. We talk about central banks um, creating money, but most money creation in modern economies um, is really by commercial banks. When they create credit, they also create corresponding uh, deposits. So if you look at a monetary aggregate like M2, which is very important in terms of thinking about the money that is available to finance economic activity through consumption, investment, and so on. In most modern economies, you know, about 90 to 95% of that is created by commercial banks, not the central bank. Um, 
So if these changes that we are seeing um, in the economy affect commercial banks, then we are going to be in a very interesting position where uh, we don't quite know who's going to create this credit. And no central bank wants to be in the position of being the one that uh, creates credit or decides how credit should be allocated in an economy. Plus, if you think about the transmission of monetary policy, when a central bank such as the ECB changes interest rates, it knows how banks will react. Um, they will increase um, saving rates, which will um, incentivize people to spend, uh, to save. It will um, cause businesses to invest less, uh, consumers to spend less. And that's how monetary policy is supposed to work. But what if banks stop becoming as important? What if these non-traditional financial platforms become more important? We don't know how sensitive they are to interest rates. Plus, if you think about the functions that the ECB, the uh, Fed played during the global financial crisis, they acted as the lenders of last resort, providing liquidity support to commercial banks. But these central banks had relationships with commercial banks. What if commercial banks become less important? How does the central bank discharge its lender of last resort function to these technology platforms which are not directly connected to the central bank. So there are lots of very complicated questions out there in terms not just of the nature of money, but also about how monetary policy implementation and transmission is going to work. I don't have answers to all of this, but at least the discussion of these issues is all uh, in the book. That's why I wanted to add another question or two, if I might. Um, if we have a, a financial system in which there are both uh, central bank backed digital currencies and cryptocurrencies that don't have any relationship to fiat currencies, don't the cryptocurrencies inevitably become essentially speculative instruments? I mean, what, what's the exchange rate mechanism when you have that situation? Yeah, that's a, um, a good question about, um, uh, and it links back to the earlier discussion about whether cryptocurrencies will be viable if central banks start issuing their own digital currencies. And um, even before the CBDCs have um, really entered the mainstream, they're already seeing um, many cryptocurrencies become essentially um, speculative financial assets because there isn't that much trading on them. Um, there isn't very much transaction activity. Uh, taking place with uh, uh, cryptocurrencies such as um, uh, Bitcoin. So the user case for cryptocurrencies as mediums of exchange will certainly be decimated um, by the emergence of central bank digital currencies. Now, one might argue that this is not necessarily a bad thing because um, uh, having these speculative assets floating around um, is not necessarily adding to financial stability. But one thing I do fear is that um, this may reduce the amount of innovation that takes place in the crypto sphere. Um, and whatever my views about uh, uh, Bitcoin as a financial asset, um, as I might have already made clear my view about blockchain as a technology, is that it really is a marvel in many ways and could really uh, change the nature of financial markets and institutions in a way that over the long run, I think has a lot of potential to benefit um, uh, societies and create a lot of new innovations. So if um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were to become uh, a lot less valuable, it's possible that the financing that they in effect provide uh, to the rest of the crypto sphere to continue with these innovations might decline. So um, in an ideal world, we will get a separation of these two, a separation between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as financial assets and the technology where we might continue to see progress. And I think to some extent that is happening already. Um, right now there are new um, uh, blockchains that are emerging with native cryptocurrencies, um, which are not um, necessarily pegged as or being used as speculative assets, but just allow those black blockchain platforms to be used a lot more efficiently for transaction purposes and also for um, smart contracts and other purposes of that sort. So I think that would be a, a better world um, and could have a lot more potential. You know, you uh, your answer um, opened up even more questions for me about um, Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I'm all for innovation and all for 
uh, maximum freedom in, in financial services. Um, but the amount of energy concern, consumed by Bitcoin raises the question why no one has even regulated that, which just seems an extravagant uh, use of energy that contributes to global warming. It just is actually something of great concern. It's enormously worrying. Um, in fact, just this morning, I received a, a call from a legislator in New York State uh, because there are many Bitcoin miners um, who want to set up operations in Bitcoin because you know China has, um, uh, which used to be a major cryptocurrency mining center, um, has uh, um, essentially banned um, uh, all such cryptocurrency mining activities. And New York State has relatively uh, cool temperatures. It also has a lot of um, hydroelectric. Uh, 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 generation capacity, um, a lot of non-renewable -renew uh, uh, resources. So Bitcoin miners are trying to make the case um, that this will generate a lot of economic activity, jobs in New York state. And um, these legislators are very concerned about the um, environmental impact and even the notion that um, you can use green energy in order to conduct Bitcoin mining. So it's okay. I think it's a fallacy because ultimately one has to think about the opportunity cost of uh, um, generating that clean energy, the other uses that it could be put to. And while Bitcoin is astoundingly clever in the way it has set up the uh, validation mechanism and in terms of how it has given incentives to people to mine uh, Bitcoin and validate transactions, it's unfortunate that all that computing power is devoted to solving these um, uh, mathematical problems that have absolutely no practical or social relevance. If only, if only the creator of Bitcoin had gone one step further and set up these problems in a way that they solved some real life problems, um, that would have been a wonderful use of real life resources. But here too, uh, Daniel, technology is beginning to show the way there are new uh, consensus mechanisms that are emerging um, that are much more clean. They do not require um, anywhere near as much energy as the proof of work consensus protocol of Bitcoin. They are much more efficient. Um, so the second most important cryptocurrency by market capitalization called Ethereum is supposed to move to a proof of stake consensus protocol either later this year or early next year, um, which will dramatically change the um, landscape because that would make um, Ethereum and the uh, Ethereum blockchain um, far more functional, far more efficient, and um, a lot greener in terms of uh, what it is trying to accomplish. The, um, the picture that you paint of, you know, the, the likely rise of central bank backed uh, digital currencies and the um, uh, inutility, if you will, of something like Bitcoin because of the speculative dimension of it uh, makes me wonder uh, what happens when Bitcoin craters, um, you know, is that going to be uh, a real risk to uh, any financial system or is it just not big enough? That is a worry. I mean, when you think about the total capitalization of all cryptocurrencies approaching two and a half trillion dollars, if that two and a half trillion dollars worth of market cap were to go to a small number in a short period, that will certainly have some effects. But it's not quite the case that we will have the sort of financial implosion that we saw back in 2008, 2009, because so far, most major financial institutions seem to have stayed out of the game. They are providing access to cryptocurrency related products and derivatives, but by and large, they're not taking leveraged bets on cryptocurrency as far as I can tell. The real pain is likely to be felt by um, uh, naive retail investors who got in at the late stages of the party. Now, we don't know when the party is going to end. Right now, Bitcoin is trading, uh, when I checked, earlier this morning, although by now the picture may have changed um, one way or the other. Bitcoin was trading somewhere um, north of $60,000, which is astonishing for just a piece of um, uh, computer code. Um, so investors who um, got in um, towards the late stages of this party, if we are at the end of the party, might be the ones who suffer um, a lot more than those who plunked money down much earlier uh, in the cryptocurrency uh, boom. So there will be some pain to be felt. And more importantly, if there is an event, a technological event or 
um, a loss of confidence event that causes that sort of tumbling of cryptocurrency prices. So I um, worry more about the effects it will have on financial innovation um, in this fast developing ecosystem. I think that would um, um, be substantially slowed down as well, which would be a bit of a shame. Yes, well, um, makes me nervous. Um, so uh, I, I hate to end on a um, with a trivial question, but nonetheless, it has been bothering me. And that is, do you have any idea why Facebook named its cryptocurrency after uh, a terrible uh, South Vietnamese dictator? That that's the question I have. Maybe there's another name for another reason for that name, but I haven't found it. Oh. Um, I had not made that connection. So they first called it Libra. And then because it had all sorts of negative connotations, because uh, regulators associated the currency with uh, Facebook, they changed the name and Facebook goes to great pains uh, to make the case that the cryptocurrency called DM, that's D-I-E-M, would be issued by um, uh, the DM association of which uh, Facebook is only one member. And the word DM, I think, comes from the mm -hmm. Latin day. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's uh, capturing the new day. Uh, so, okay. so that's the um, allusion that they're trying to um, bring into people's minds. And um, again, it is going to be issued and managed by the DM association, uh, which has about um, 25 to 30 members. But I think there is no doubt about what the real financial power behind um, face uh, behind DM might be. So I think there are lots of um, concerns to be had. Um, so Daniel, since we're wrapping up, I should just say that for those of you whose heads are still spinning, um, I'd invite you to read my book, which I hope um, presents a lot of these issues with a little more clarity. Um, and in addition to thanking um, Daniel and his colleagues for giving me this privilege, um, I think I can end on no better note than the title of my uh, of the last chapter of my book, which is "A Glorious Future Beckons, Perhaps." <laughs> okay, Esther, thank you so much for a completely fascinating talk about uh, a pretty um, uh, challenging and arcane subject, which uh, looks like it's about to affect us all in a very, very powerful way. Um, we look forward to having you in. Um, in uh, Berlin soon. And uh, it sounds to me like there's plenty more to talk about on just this issue. So we won't have to wait until your next book. But uh, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I look forward to welcoming, welcoming you on the Bonsai. I just wanna let everyone uh, else know that our next uh, event will be tomorrow night. Um, we will have a, um, uh, an, a, a, a hybrid uh, event, uh, which is going to take place Tomorrow, I'm trying to uh, uh, just find the title. I know it's with the Yale scholar, uh, Helen Su, who is going to talk about um, uh, China and its encounters in Africa. So um, I don't have the title handy. I have too many windows open on my screen, but I do hope you will join us for that. Look at the website for the details. Again, thanks very much to Professor Eswar Prasad, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you, Daniel, and I look forward to seeing you in Berlin. Take care.